Hello, Global Gardeners. Welcome to another wonderful Monday to talk about gardening with the gardeners from all around the world who are watching today and a special guest today, another global gardener from the UK in Wales. We've got Tony O'Neill joining the show today. So let's get right to it because Tony's here. I'm here. And let's have Tony O'Neill join the show today. Hi, Tony. Hey, Scott. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? And so the reason I asked Tony to come on and talk specifically about composting today is that Tony has written a book and we'll be talking about that over the course of the show today. And it, it's being edited and hopefully it'll be coming out soon. He'll tell you more about that. Most of you I know not only watch the Gardener Scott channel, but watch Tony at the Simplify Gardening channel. If you're just tuning in and don't know Tony, Simplify Gardening is a fantastic channel that Tony does in his home in Wales and is recognized, and, and this is the way I, th I think of it, Tony. I think you're recognized around the world as an expert in growing potatoes. Some of your best performing videos around potatoes. A lot yeah. of us refer to you f to learn about potatoes, but now I think you're about to become a world expert in composting. And so share with us just a little bit about uh, your journey with compost and what led you to, to write a book on composting that, that gardeners, I think, are really going to want to see. Scott, I think what it is that you know what it's like when you get a channel yourself, you find that um, people come to you and they ask in question after question, why, is it, why are my plants doing this? Why are they doing that? Why aren't they growing? And a lot of it, usually reverts back to nutrition and the problem they have is they're uh, growing in a garden where the soil's never been looked after they don't understand things about ph and uh, nitrogen potassium phosphorus and things like that or they think that they can go and buy uh, some bagged soil and just grow in that forever and the reason i decided to write this book was because i kept seeing people struggling with making their own compost at home you know mm -hmm. they may be you know adding ingredients into a, a compost heap and it's never breaking down or vice versa they're throwing loads of stuff in and it's turning into a big slimy smelly mess and i'm just it's so many times i was getting these questions you know what am i doing wrong and you know everybody throws around um things about like the 30 to one ratio as far as carbon to nitrogen but a lot of people don't really understand it. and I thought right. well I'll write the book all around the the basis of, of composting and uh, as I started writing that book it sort of expanded and um, uh, I went down the rabbit hole a little bit and it became a book all about um, the sort of the whole structure around composting and uh, and the process and and where the microbial life and uh, nematodes and fungal and stuff like that all play a part and how it plays a part and how the compost will go through different um, thermic layers when it you know as it ages and cools down. Oh yeah, and and, and I actually so for those of you that are watching, I actually was was lucky enough to read an advanced copy that Tony shared with me. And that's one of the best aspects, I think, in the book. There's a lot of other guidance out there that tells how to compost. You know, like you say, add this much nitrogen, that much carbon, do a couple flips and you'll have compost. But you really do, I mean, you call it a rabbit hole, but I call it research and some in-depth information that talks about the fungal activity, the bacterial activity, and what really makes compost. And so uh, why don't you share with us, if you would, um, some of your experiences. You talk about what we've gone through. I think most of us who, who have made compost have had those problems in the past. So kind of what is your um, defining moment where the light bulb came on and you kind of figured it all out? Do you know, I think that was probably maybe about 15, 20 years ago when uh, I was having those issues as well. 
and it sort of dawned on me that the more wet stuff I put into this compost, the more it turned into a slimy mess and never broke down, or the more dry stuff I put into it, it never broke down. And but the, I ha I knew there had to be a right balance because there was people all around me making really good quality compost, and I just couldn't get that knack. And then I remember speaking <coughs> to um, an old gardener who was on one of the community allotments that we were at, and I said to him, why is it that you always get the perfect compost, but every time I do it, it either doesn't break down or turns into a slimy mess. And he said to me, your ratios are all wrong. And um, the biggest, I think the biggest issue, I mean, compost can be easy. You can take pretty much a bucket of, of carbon, a bucket of nitrogen, chuck it in the thing. Eventually that will break down. But to make quality compost, you need to understand the fundamentals in the compost. You need to know, um that compost needs to be a 30 to 1 ratio but it also needs to be no more than 60 percent in moisture now to tell if it's 60 percent in moisture you can just grab a handful of the ingredients give them a squeeze and you should only see at least uh, at the very most one drop coming out of of that compost but you, the problem you have is balancing that uh the the ratio of carbon to nitrogen and the ratio of moisture at the same time now what a lot of people don't realize is that the certain ingredients that they're using they think that they get that balance just right but then the water content is way high and what mm -hmm. happens then is you end up actually drowning all the microbial life it's just too wet for them now they need about 60 percent moisture because that's how they get around the compost because they they, they live in the fluid as, as such but when it gets too wet what happens is you um the compost compresses and it goes anaerobic and then all the aerobic microbes die off now you can mm -hmm. make anaerobic compost and they cover that in the book as well but um that tends to be uh things like in trench composting and uh when you're doing uh fermentations and things like that but um it's really about the microbial life and that's when you you know that you're getting good quality compost um you know it's all well and good having stuff that looks like soil but if it's got no life in it um no nutrition in it and everything else well it's just any other medium at that point so um uh, you know but it's, it's it's about getting that and i i spoke to this guy and he really explained it to me and he said good. do this and you'll never go wrong and he was right and for 20 odd years i've been making compost with no problems at all i've got probably five tons of it sat in a pile at the moment uh wow. waiting to be used on the garden and i i've got a video coming out uh very shortly about you know about how i do with that you know um and there will eventually be a course to go with the book that's fantastic so i, I know one of the big questions that i get a lot too and I, I know you get the same questions is what can we compost when we're talking about those ingredients so carlos from northern spain is asking if cherry laurel and hydrangea can be used in composting and so like you said i think anything can be composted if it's organic but um specifically do you want to address carlos's question yeah so when like uh, scott just said you can compost anything that's ever lived doesn't matter what it is okay you can compost it however things like laurel and hydrangeas and stuff like that and the evergreens and what have you well they take a lot longer and they have chemicals within the leaf that actually prevent them from decaying as fast so the issue you have is um they um firstly they can put uh ingredients into the compost that you don't want once the compost is broken down but if you those sort of ingredients like the cherry laurel and things like that you're better off making compost away from your main pile so that those don't leach into your main compost and give them time in which to break down those um those sort of ingredients within the leaves that can affect the growing of other plants and things like that but it's mainly because they're like evergreen leaves and things like that they, they you know they they don't like to decay because they don't turn brown like normal leaves would do when they come off a tree um and the decaying they they've got like a the best way i can explain this like um 
uh, like an antifreeze that goes through the, the the veins of the leaf that doesn't allow them to break down that easily. Um, so although you can compost those types of things, you're better off composting them separately on their own and uh, keeping them away from your main pile. And it's kind of like making leaf mold. You know, I, I do the same thing. If I have a lot of woody materials or a lot of leaves, uh, just make a separate pile so that those ingredients that take a longer time to break down, you can set that off in some corner of the garden and let it decompose while you're compost pile is is rolling right along and decomposing and, and being course, ready to use faster you can speed that up by shredding them and the finer you shred them the easier it is for the bacteria and the fungal and everything else to actually get in penetrate the leaf and and, and start working on it but you need to break down those lignins and things that are in the leaf um you know and but by by shredding them that will speed the process up but it's still going to take some time and so this question ties in a little bit with that because <clears throat> uh, John is asking the question from Kansas using kitchen waste composting in a dome composter and occasionally adding leaves and sawdust. Uh, is she doing it right? Okay, so you're better off. Now, when you're taking waste from a kitchen, uh, from your kitchen and putting it in, you've got a lot of nitrogen there okay and it's quite wet again and as, as you remember earlier on we were talking about the carbon to nitrogen ratio putting in the leaves and and the sawdust will help however you need to be careful in the sawdust you're putting in um a lot of pine sawdust isn't good really because um it's coming from the heart of the pine wood and it's got a lot of sap and things in it that can uh really affect the ph of the compost so consider that just check any hardwood compost, uh, hardwood um, shavings that he has uh, will be fine in there. But also consider um, the moisture content that you're putting in. You know, if you're only putting in like 50% sort of um, leaves and wood and then 50% kitchen scraps, you're going to find that that's going to turn into a slimy mess because it's just not enough carbon um, to be able to offset all the nitrogen and the, and the uh, moisture that you're putting into that. Uh, compost heap so yeah. just bear that in mind okay and uh, th this this ties in a little bit as well uh, with the idea of the greens and how to accelerate your compost marshes uh, saying hi from North Carolina started composting in the fall using a three bin system is there a way to accelerate the compost without adding the greens or the nitrogen component yeah so You've already got carbon and nitrogen already in the mix, okay? You won't have used all the nitrogen up. And nitrogen is also being replenished by the microbial life that's in the soil. So the best thing you can do for that now to, to uh, get it going and speed the process up is to turn the compost. So by turning it, it introduces more air, okay? And that will uh, allow the microbial life to uh, continue to multiply and that will help the process go along again but in future um you know just for reference i only turn my compost once i i'm not turning i'm not in a rush to make my compost right. i'm happy for it to make it now for the end of june and then i'll make it then sort of july august then uh, when all the stuff is coming off the garden and ready for now so um i make two batches a year but i'm making you know, four, five, ten a year. So, you know, I don't have to worry about making, sorry, four, five, ten a time. I don't have to worry about okay. making multiple batches throughout the year, you know, making it in, you know, 30 days or whatever. If you wanted to do that, turn it as soon as you, once it hits a thermolithic uh, uh, layers within the compost, so it's 60 uh, degrees centigrade, 55, 60 degrees centigrade. And once you start seeing the decline of that heat, that's telling you it's time to turn again. Um, a lot of people have struggled getting the heat into their compost. And, um, uh, and and that's mainly because of either it's too wet or there's not enough carbon to nitrogen in it. And if you get that right, it will hit those temperatures. Yeah, and, and that's about 120 to 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, you can get up as high as 150 without any problems, but anything over that, then you're going to start killing off microbial life and things so um ideally uh 
between 140 150 something like that would be perfect and at that sort of temperature you're going to kill off all the pathogens and the weed seeds that are in the compost as well yeah that's fantastic and so uh, another way and, and actually this is <clears throat> a way that i tend to do a lot of my compost because i just don't have enough organic material to to do that what you're doing yet and so Jennifer's saying uh, she has a pile in the corner of the yard and they just keep adding to it yeah. with the grass clippings and leaves and and veggies. And uh, she thinks the stuff at the bottom is ready to use. And so this is this is an approach I do where it's basically like a layer cake yeah. and the bottom will decompose and and I'll take the top and flip it into another bin because it hasn't decomposed because I'm slowly adding to it and then the bottom is ready to use so uh how we often talk about the hot composting methods like we just were but how about like a, a cold composting or a composting yeah, method so, like this well this this method is fine because um it, it's a longer process but and it will go anaerobic okay um so what happens is as things start to break down and as the microbial life starts to break down the ingredients within the compost, especially in the center, it'll get hot in, in the middle there. And then as as it starts to cool down, um, the layers collapse on each other and they cake a little bit. Yeah. That is fine. The microbial life will continue working on it, but eventually it pushes all the air out. So what happens is a lot of the, the uh, aerobic bacteria will either go dormant or will die and then anaerobic bacteria will take over the process and continue the process but it's a lot slower and you may get some smell of um like sulfur and things coming from the pile as it breaks down um and that's just basically because it's anaerobic and this is when you smell it a lot um it smells like pickling when when if you leave grass sit in a bag for a couple of days cut grass you know it pickles and that's what what it goes like it's because it's gone anaerobic um but even anaerobic compost can be made and i cover that in the book um and it's literally this is the process you just keep adding to the top of it and eventually it'll break down and, yeah. and consequently that's like these dalek style bins that i i used to use that i put the leaf mold in um i've just literally got rid of them because i'm going to be building some more of the bays i have but um but essentially that's how they work is you just keep piling in the top and you pull it out of the bottom and it just collapse down. And, but it is a much longer process. You could be looking anything from 12 months to 18 months for it to, you know, for yeah. you know, a good layer of it to be ready for you. So if you uh, need lots of compost, it's not the process to use, but if you're just looking to add just small amounts as a mulch around the garden or something like that, or to add to the potting soil, then it's an ideal process. You can stick it out of the way at the back of, you know, of the garden or behind a shed or whatever. And it's a good process because you can just forget about it. You haven't got to worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and patience is the key years ago before I knew even a fraction of what I know now, I, I got a, a plastic composter, from our local utilities and it was just a, a a square bin that you added to the top and there was a little door at the bottom that you opened up and i didn't understand at the time that it was a very lengthy process to just add to the top and eventually harvest from the bottom yeah. and like so many others i i spent a long time trying to figure out what am i doing wrong with this compost and because of the design of that composter i really wasn't doing anything wrong i just didn't know that you have to have patience for yeah. a year or year and a half before you can actually harvest and anything. i think that's the issue as well with it, especially a lot of new gardeners who don't understand the process and this way i break down all the process of all the different composting including like the legs of bakashi trench composting uh coal composting all of these different composting types of, you know vessel composting because i break them down because they all have their own uh little uh innate ability to uh throw the new gardener off um you know you're there thinking well why is this guy up there pulling out a ton of compost out of his compost bay and i can't even get this small amount to work right. and and you just need to change 
a few things that you're doing depending on the process you're using and then you need to understand that process so you can say right that what i'm putting in you now will be ready in 12 to 18 months not in six weeks time exactly exactly and so uh mage gray wolf um is doing it completely differently and this especially if you don't have a lot of material this is an interesting option too where you just take the the empty bags and fill them up with your material again in that same basic 30 to 1 blend is what i'm guessing she's doing um but i i haven't actually done this i've done it a little bit with leaves to make yeah. le leaf mold but have you ever done this to actually uh do compost no i haven't done it with compost only because um the the issue you have here this would be an anaerobic process if if you're sealing the bags in but also um the like with leaf mold it's more fungal dominated mm -hmm. with with this it's bacteria dominated and, and the problem with bacteria is it needs a good sized mound really for it to get going to, for this, the heat yeah for, for the heat and for the microbial life to to really get going now this would be more like i said of um an anaerobic process an anaerobic uh composting is fine because uh you can put it in these bags put them behind and forget about it and it will work and that's fine and it'll work on smaller amounts you don't need to worry about it getting hot the only downside to this sort of process is you never uh, kill any pathogens that are in the soil so it, for argument's sake say you've picked up something like um fungal spores from um powdery mildew or uh blights uh yeah. onion white rot those sort of things you don't always kill those off with with a cold compost and you certainly don't kill off weed seeds so that's the only thing but everything else like i said it doesn't matter you know what it is if it was living before um and you you'd stick it in a bag or bucket or whatever eventually that will break down it's just timing again and if it's working uh you know that's fantastic that's all you need to worry about and it's a the whole process is about people finding ways that work for them and what they can do around their schedule so that they they get a, you know a, pro, a quality product at the end of it but they utilizing the organics that are their garden is growing it's not going off to landfill somewhere and yeah. they're getting the benefit back in their soils yeah absolutely and and a big issue empress kimberly touches on something i know a lot of new gardeners are asking because they know they're supposed to compost but they're not sure where to put the compost pile and and i have this problem in my region we are so hot and dry in the summer yeah. that if we put our pile in full sun it, it dries out. It has to be watered every single day to maintain moisture. So yeah. putting it in the shade makes sense. But if we put it in the shade and then we get the freezing temperatures, the pile ends up freezing faster than it might otherwise. And this is why um, large piles of like a, a cubic uh, meter, you know, yeah. sort of three and a half cubic feet. Um, that is good for a reason because of that size of that pile the center of that pile will never ever freeze no matter how cold it gets right because all the microbial life all migrate to the center of that pile and they they are breeding and doing their thing and they're creating a little bit of heat the outer areas of, of the compost will freeze but the inners won't now the the, the process you know the, the whole thing about this um as far as shade and sun goes um i've got mine out in the sun but it, you know if you've got hot temperatures put in a shade but just do yourself a favor don't put it under a tree like a lot of people seem to do mm -hmm. they think oh well under a tree is a dead space because you know it's very shady things don't grow there so it's a perfect place to think about putting a compost bin and it gives the compost shade the problem is that the root systems of the trees can actually um wick out all the moisture out of the compost as well because as they are drawing moisture out of the soil below it that then through capillary action sucks all the moisture out of the compost too so just bear that in mind um you, you know great at putting it in a shaded area um it doesn't need the heat from the sun at all so you don't need it um but but 
don't put it directly underneath the tree because you will lose moisture that way as well. And so let's talk about some ways to, like I mentioned, those of us that don't have a lot of organic matter to, to build a, a one meter by one meter by one meter pile, which would be ideal. Walking on Sunshine says, can it really accelerate if you're in a small garden with limited space uh, and you want to make the most of it? What, what can... Can, what can we do to add material to the pile to get it to the point where it's big enough for the thermophilic bacteria to kick in and generate the heat and really accelerate the pile rather than what most of us, and it sounds like walking on sunshine is doing, we just add a little bit at a time and then it takes a long time and there's no way to accelerate it. That's what the issue you have is to generate those sort of thermolithic heat layers you need mass and without mass you're not going to generate that okay yep. because what happens is you add a little bit the microbes go to work and then they run out of food even though it hasn't finished breaking down they run out of the sugars and everything that they that they're living on and then because of that um the pile cools again then you add a bit more so it warms up a bit and then it cools again so this essentially this is what you're doing constantly with those sorts of piles Ideally, you need, um, uh, like I said, that one cubic meter. Now, I understand that not every garden generates a lot of uh, material like that, but, but you can store it. Now, I, in one of my older videos, um, you will see piles and piles of uh, the, in fact, the potato video that I recently done, you will see piles of um, uh, material just stacked on top of the bins, okay? that is me storing material ready for the next batch i'm making underneath that probably about three quarters of the way down the the actual um bay is finished compost i've just stuck this stuff on top of it it's yeah. not composting because i haven't mixed it but it's sat there waiting for me to mix and one of the bays is just full of grass clippings from last year and that'd be pickling away and it would be smelly when i open it up and do it but is good nitrogen that I can add into a new compost. So you can store these ingredients, just chop them up, put them in bags and just store them separately. And then when you've got enough, then make your pile. Um, yep. So that's the first way. The second way though, if you can't make a big pile because of space reasons, then the smaller you chop it down and get the ratios right. Um, and that will help to um, compost the ingredients much much faster so you really need to shred those ingredients down but don't shred them to like a fine powder because obviously you need some sort of structure in the compost yeah. to allow airflow and, and what have you but if you shred down a lot of it but keep some of some bigger parts that you can take out later that will just allow that airflow to go that is a quicker way to to do it but like scott has said um what he's been doing is taking the top off the pile getting the good stuff and then starting a new pile well essentially that's what i do i just dump things on top of my compost that's finishing i'm not mixing it in i'm not meant to be and eventually i'll take that off and then i'll create a new pile from start with that um i've got buckets that i grow the potatoes in at the moment jammed stuff with stuff from last August, I've got some old um, brassicas, um, some bok choy and things like that, all waiting to be cut up and mm -hmm. and what have you and added to the next batch. And that's essentially what, you know, what I do. So, you know, find somewhere you can store it behind a shed somewhere, just put it in a bag, just leave it until you're ready and then make your pile when you've got enough. Yeah, I, I, I'm occasionally asked because people will see the, the bags in the background in my videos and i've got bags of grass bags of leaves bags of sawdust that are just sitting waiting to be added to the garden and yeah. and here actually here in colorado we have a lot of uh small breweries and brew pubs and there are a lot of things like that around the world that you can get yeah. their waste and and boost your pile it doesn't all have to come from your garden and you can collect it from your neighbors if your neighbors are mowing their lawns or yeah. throwing and, out their waste. And and things like, you know, you'll get uh, tree surgeons and things that will you know, be more than happy to drop off wood chips to you. So you can keep that in a separate pile. So you've got a carbon source there. You can buy, um, you know, 
uh, straw, barley straw and things yep. from like um, equine places or farm stores, things like that. Just buy a bale of that. You just be surprised how long that goes. So all of a sudden you've got a good couple of carbon sources there that are, are free. And I'm sure there are a load of people around you that cut their lawns and just stick it, you know, in bags for um, the, the local council to collect and things. Well, ask them if they'll keep them for you. All of a sudden, you've got a good nitrogen source. You know, then you add your kitchen scraps into it, any waste from the garden. Before you know it, you've got more than enough stuff to yeah. make a good pile. Absolutely. It's just about, about thinking about it. Just be careful that you're not going to places that have been spraying like a, a broadleaf herbicide or something like that and uh, just know where your stuff is coming from but there is nothing wrong with um using other people's waste as well because you know it's it's good for your garden it's going to put that nutrition back into your garden absolutely absolutely and i and i most of the bags i have actually have come from other people uh, and so this is a really good question and uh, we talked about the 30 to 1 ratio. Uh, and so is this a volume ratio or is it by weight? Neither. <laughs> right. Okay. So That's why it's a really good question. Yeah. Because this is right. what people this is think. What people, yeah, they do. And they think, well, if I put half of this and half of this, it'll work. Or if I put like 30 times of this and, and, and one of these, it'll work. It, it doesn't work like that. Every single ingredient that goes in your compost has... A carbon and a nitrogen um, amount of okay. I'll give you some sort of example. Wood chips about four hundred parts carbon to one part nitrogen in the wood chip itself, whereas your weeds um, are about fifty fifty. So they they have about uh, you know sort of maybe a ten to fifteen part carbon and again a ten to fifteen part nitrogen. Um, so you could literally just put weeds in there, and they will break down because they have the soil built in and and what have you but knowing what each component that you're putting in the compost is uh carrying that carbon to nitrogen ratio is important and that's why i carry quite a large chart in my book that breaks down all the ingredients and the carbon and nitrogen ratio of each ingredient so straw is about 150 to one so you know so depending on the ingredients you're adding at the time you can then work it out and in fact for those people who buy the book i've created a calculator that does all the workings out for you there is a you you read the the book scott there's a process yeah. in there that's quite in depth that we go into the carbon nitrogen rule um quite a lot and there's a lot of calculations to work through but rather than you have to worry about that, I've created an Excel calculator and you literally go there, you put in the weight of what you have and, you, and, and the ingredients and it will work out the actual carbon and nitrogen ratio. That's and fantastic. You can then alter the amounts of each so until you get your 30 to 1 balance. And um, that calculator will be available via a download um, from my website, I just got to put the link in the finished book. That's all. Awesome, awesome. And so that that highlights that composting can be very scientific. Yeah, yeah. That you you have all of the formulas in your book, all of the math figured out. I think it's just fantastic. You have all of the examples of all the ingredients with the the individual carbon to nitrogen ratios for those individual ingredients. But I think you would agree with this in the garden when we make compost, there's actually an art to it as we start putting the ingredients. And here's a really good point from Lily. Before we go on to that. Oh, Scott, yeah, Scott. sure. Um, that's why in the book we go right through the process from um, explaining what every sort of composting type is and then um, we get right into the crux of it, all of the uh, science behind it and everything else. But in reality, you're literally grabbing handfuls of this and that and throwing it into a pile. And what I, the, the book has been written so that the new gardener can understand how to make compost, but also for those who really want to know the science behind it, that's in there as well. So, um, so this is the important thing. I, what I don't want to do is put people off making compost because right. they think it's too hard. Um, that's why I'm creating a 
the course as well that can be purchased alongside the book only because um the book shows you you can make it as easy or as hard as you want but i wanted to cover everything in the book that's why it's called a composting masterclass, so that everybody no matter where you are in that composting journey there's something for for you yeah Good. so for like for you who's been gardening for 30 years and knows a lot about compost you know there's all of the calculations behind it and why it works because of the science and everything else. And, and that's why that's all included in it. But I don't want people thinking, oh, it's too much information. Yeah, good I'm point. not going to compost. Good know? point. Yeah, I, I think your book is is superb for a, a beginner gardener who has never composted before and also for the experienced composter who's trying to figure out how to do it scientifically. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, and Lily was wondering about, and this this is a perfect example when I when I start thinking about where experience comes in, is pine shavings very high in a carbon component, and then the chicken manure manure very high in a nitrogen component, and and I use wood shavings and chicken manure as well because my daughter and my neighbors share when they clean out their coops. But this also ties in with with animal bedding, with horse manure and straw. And and so when we do it like this, from my experience, you really can't break it down scientifically because it's all mixed up and it, it there really is. You just have to do it. But your pile speaks to you and your, your pile will smell. So so if you're adding pine shavies pine shavings and chicken manure to your pile. How can you tell if you're doing enough or not enough? So when um, I want to cover here the difference between animal bedding and the pine shavings we were taught or the pine sawdust we were talking about earlier on, because there's, there's, there's different things. The animal bedding, okay, firstly, has been steamed and everything. A lot of the saps and stuff are taken out of it right. for protection of the animals. And that's the issue I had over someone taking woodworking shavings and pines. You just got to be careful with that, okay? So pine shavings that are used for animal bedding, so for poultry and uh, for equine purposes, things like that, they're fine to use, no problem at all. And they will um, break down, but they, ha they are high. Again, the shavings probably around about a 400 to one in nitrogen, but um, poultry manure is very, very strong in the nitrogen range, and that's probably vice versa. It's probably one to four hundred. So, the 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 fact that you've got them balanced now, again, it depends how often you're cleaning out your coop, because you could be cleaning your coop out once a week, and there's hardly any manure in it at all, and it's all mm -hmm. shavings. Or you could be going for like a deep litter where you're constantly turning it over, and that's had a year's worth of manure going in it. What I would suggest with this stuff is um, I would pile it up for about a week or two first on its own and just see if that heats up. If it doesn't heat up, it's got more carbon in there. If it starts heating up, it's got more, uh, it's got a lot of nitrogen in it and then you can balance it out. And this is why I'm saying to people about storing these sort of ingredients. They, you, you understand them a little bit better. And, but then, what I would also do then is layer your compost with just a fine layer of this stuff and then add a layer of grass clippings. So if there's uh, not enough nitrogen, it can draw it out of the grass clippings. And by building that lasagna um, yeah. uh, layers within the actual compost system, then you're able to balance out any sort of nitrogen or carbon loss within within it because they can draw it through the layers making thin layers rather than deep layers you know and yeah. um but again like you said uh it's something that you will learn your nose is going to tell you if it's smelling then you've got way too much nitrogen and if it's not you know if it's staying the same color and everything else it's way too much carbon but um but over time you you get to know oh, I just need to add about this much. You know when you're cleaning out, you know how much your birds are messing because it can also depend, you know, someone who's keeping six hens and someone who's keeping 50 hens, totally different manure again. So it's really about trial and, and error there a little bit. Exactly. And, That's where and the experience comes in. No one book can ever give you that. So 
just put in this amount because it just doesn't work. You have to see what happens, especially with the bedding sort of issue. Um, you know, you just have to look at it and think, right, okay, I'm going to put a thin layer in here, see how that looks. Oh, that's looking okay. Put another thin layer in and and, and so on. Um, but the good thing about the bedding is you never, ever have to add it all in one go. Keep some back for the next batch. It's not an issue, you know. Um, what you don't want to do is overload it with that because every compost needs a good balance of everything that you can put in it. And the more diverse the ingredients, the better quality the compost you'll have out. Absolutely. So the the for the last three or four gardens that I've built, the very first thing I did was figure out where my compost bin was going to go. I constructed the compost bin and I actually started composting before I put my first beds in because then I always advocate spending time to make sure you choose the best location for your beds. But but I start composting right away. And so Josh was asking, in winter now, there's been a lot of comments back and forth about snow and cold weather. And so can you start a compost pile in winter? You can start a compost pile at any time. Exactly. Now, and and this is what I think a lot of people think, uh, you know, they get afraid of or they think it's winter. I got i got stuff i want to compost and it's just going to freeze but it doesn't as i said earlier on if you've got that mass that center core will never freeze because the microbes all uh, start multiplying they stay in the center and they create the heat and because they're creating the heat that then dissipates to the outer levels and obviously the, the outer levels will will freeze but then the center will never freeze so they're already breaking it down but the important thing about starting it the, you know, even in the winter, is the fact that you're giving the microbes chance to multiply. Now, they're going to do this a lot slower than they would in the height of summer, but they will still multiply and they will still continue breaking down the, the compost. And what you may find is coming into spring, you may have to turn that to really kick it off. But other than that, you can start a compost heap at any point. And so, I've had heaps with snow. In fact, I was oh, yeah. emptying one last year. I've had heaps. You know, I've got two feet of snow around me, and I put the fork in, and you can just see this steam piling out of the compost where all the microbial life. And we've had, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks of snow before it. So it just shows that, that they're still working underneath that. And you can okay. insulate it with carpets or whatever, you know? Well, and even the snow is a good insulator. You know, it is, it, yeah. It, it doesn't get colder than 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero degrees Celsius when it's covered with snow. So it might be much, much colder air outside, but the snow is actually helping to keep the pile, at least the outer edges of the pile, a little bit warmer. And it's just managing that moisture is the important part around winter. You know, you don't want to go in over 60%, um, but uh, around winter, there's a lot of rain and everything else. What I would say for those who are insulating the top of their compost with like a carpet, like I am, no, I will be building a, a roof structure over these eventually. I just haven't got around to it. And I've been composting in these now for nearly three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And uh, But what I will say is put a sheet of black plastic or something over the top first and then put the carpet layer over the top of that. And then that won't, what will happen then, the excess rain and things like that will be shed to the outsides and they'll just run down and run off. Yeah. So you're not actually getting the core of the compost too wet. That's good. That's good. So so we talked about how anything organic, anything that, that came from or once was part of a living animal can be composted. Yeah. And so there's, there's some things, I did a video about this, and one of the things I talked about that you can use is urine. And I've actually done this myself. Um, and so it, is urine part of your composting? Um, I do use urine and I don't purposely just go and fill bottles and stuff like that, but I will use it. Um, and I've used it as well for kickstarting leaf mold. But uh, urine is packed with um, nitrogen, I think it's something like 23% nitrogen. So, you know, it's a lot of nitrogen in urine and it's yeah. a really good activator of composts. And um, uh, the initial watering, if you had a, a water, you know, a urine water down like 10 to 1 or something like that and use that for your initial watering to, to moisten everything down and that'd be a really good activator. Um, but it's not, 
you know, it's not something that I'm worried about doing. You know, if if I've if I've got stored urine or whatever, I'll I'll use it. If I haven't, then I won't bother. Um, but don't forget things like animal beddings, you know, horse mm-hmm. beddings, things like that. They're going to have lots of urine in it. Um, you know, those sort of things. So you're putting it in anyway. You know. Yeah, and and I do the same thing. I'll use it to to jumpstart a pile, like in spring after winter when I add a lot of new dried from the bags that I was saving, and then um, and then once the compost pile's going, I'll use it exactly like you said for the leaf mold. Yeah, people worry about uh, urine, and it it gets a bit of a stigma and things when when composting. But what they don't seem to realize is urine is a sterile fluid anyway. When it comes out the body is sterile it's only later that it picks up pathogens and things like that well if you're mm-hmm. putting that into a sealed bottle it's not a problem because it's going to stay sterile and then if you put it straight into your compost it's, it's done and dusted the microbial life will break that down completely anyway i mean you you've got composting toilets now anyway you know it's yeah. you can compost anything um anything that was living whether that be you know human beings and or dogs or cats whatever the case be you can compost anything that was once living mm-hmm. and um uh, as a side note you you know there are um companies now um creating pods for people to be buried in that i was just to gonna say, to bring that you know, up because we we become an, a you know a fertilizer in effect and um we compost down and, and fertilize that tree and it's a great way of of using that you know that resource i'm not saying i'm going to go stick someone's body in my compost but but it just goes to show that you can compost anything that was once living yeah absolutely and so here's here's a pretty basic question because those of us that have been composting for a while often just take it for granted that we know what we're talking about when we say we use a three bin system but but what is a three bin system i actually have a two bin system right now that i'm going to expand and, and move to another part of my garden and make it a three bin system. So, okay. The uh, idea behind a three bin system is that um, you make the pile in one bin, and then as it comes out to the thermolithic um, temperatures and it starts declining, you then turn that compost into the next bin. In reality, that doesn't happen because you end up filling all the bins. So, but but the, the, the idea is is that there's another bay next to you. You move the compost over, and you've introduced it, but it's still in in the bin system. And by the mm-hmm. time you get to the third turn, which moves it from one side of the compost bay to another, then that compost should be more or less finished. Now I only turn my compost once, and I believe that's all it really needs when it's built properly. Okay, and the I've got a five bay system. So if I've got a spare bay, I will turn into that bay. It's not a problem. But, you know, there's no issue with turning it out onto the ground beside the bay and then putting it back in the bay afterwards. So you're double turning it in effect. Um, You know, but the idea of the three bay system is so that you keep a bay empty, you move it from one into the next and move it down and then and then refill the other one. So by the time you get to the end of the three bay system, you've got compost more or less coming out to finishing and you use that and that's the idea um like i said i've got a five bay system uh, that's all made from pallets and funny enough when i did the potato harvest out of the compost the other day uh, that video everybody was asking me if that was concrete but it, they just made out of pallets yeah and and and, and i do it the same way I, because i haven't had enough material in the last couple of years i only have the two but i only turn my pile once as well i, I build it all and then I flip it into that empty bay, and that's really the only time. I'm, I might fluff it up a little bit if I notice that it's it's getting a little cool, uh, but you, it doesn't sorry. have to be every week you go out and, and turn the pile if you don't want to. And that's it. If you're getting the structure right now, a lot of people challenge me over the way I built my compost my compost bays because I seal the walls, and they they say, well, no air can get in there. But there is already huge amounts of air within the compost because it's about the structure of the compost pile when you build it. And then that's got enough air in there for it to get up into that thermolithic area, stay hot for a while, and then on the cool down, turn it. That is it. 
because once it goes back up there and stays there for a bit longer, it's had everything it needs on the cool down. You can leave it cool down then and allow the, the worms and the arthropods and everything else to move in and do what they need to do to finish up the decomposition of that compost. So, I mean, the I've got video from when I emptied the uh, potatoes out of that video the other day, and it's just ram full of, of uh, red wriggler worms which have come on their own they haven't been put in there you know and they will find your bay uh once it cools down but they won't come until that starts cooling down yeah and and i completely agree and and i encourage gardeners that if they're going to do compost they should do it on bare ground so that they yeah. can get that but here's a good question from taco promotions what do you do if you have concrete if you're in an apartment and you don't have that space that you can actually get the the beetles and the worms and and the arthropods and everything else that are part of the decomposition process so what would you recommend so you can build a compost bay on concrete and they will find that compost bay i mean i don't know many people will have seen like especially if it's been raining worms that are all, like on the path and uh, wedged in between plastic of, of the polytunnel or whatever the case being, they do come out of soil and, and they will migrate across things when it's wet to get to where they want to go because they will know it's there. Um, but for those who are struggling with space, um, you know, you could go down the fermentation routes with like bakashi bins and things like that. Now, I've got a couple of bakashi bins here and it's part of my book. In fact, it's quite a large section of my book. Now, bakashi composting is fantastic. And you're literally just putting food scraps into a bin. The fluids come out at the other end, but you end up then with a fermented compost that you can then add to um, some other uh, scraps and veg and uh, and garden waste, and then put that into a trench compost. But because the fermentation's already kicked off, it's absolutely loaded with bacteria, yeah. ready to colonize the rest of it in an anaerobic way. It is an anaerobic process. But um, uh, a lot of questions I've had around that is, does Bakashi smell? Because of course, you're just putting these scraps into a bin every time you take a lid off. People worry about things like fruit flies and things like that. Mm -hmm. But there's um, Bakashi brand and um, uh, a product called the M1, um, which is effective microbes. The the brand itself is inoculated with this M1 and it covers over the top of these um, ingredients that you put into this bin. And the bacteria actually stop any smell at all and in fact i've got one that i needed to take a few photos for the book in and i opened it up and you'll see a white mold appear across the top and that just shows it's working perfectly and but when you take that lid off and i done it in the house and take the lid off there is no smell at all to it and it's a really good way of composting with um with your kitchen scraps and then being able to go and put that into like a trench or something along with a lot of other waste burying it over and knowing that the microbes are there doing their thing that's great that's the that's best great. way i i think you can do it but if you want to build a compost bin on concrete just build it the the, the worms and things will migrate into it eventually yeah yeah it, it, it's crazy how the worms i've talked about that before when i had the school garden that was surrounded by concrete and yeah. after a couple years with all the organic matter in the soil and the compost piles, we had worms everywhere because because they do migrate across the path and the parking lot when it's when it's raining. And they'll, they'll notice they because of the runoff from the compost because you will yeah. get leaching uh, from the compost then because it can't go to ground. So they'll notice there anyway and they will find it. Yeah. So here's a question from the UK. Jane in London is wondering about the slugs and snails that are breeding or laying eggs. And, and it's not just slugs and snails. There's lots of other um, animals and insects that can use the, the materials in the compost pile. But is this really a problem? No. Um, look, slugs and snails, although we hate them uh, munching down on our lettuce and things like that, they are quite an important uh, part of the process but what you have in compost is you have a very high number of nematodes and there's four groups of nematodes that i discuss in the book and one of the groups of nematodes actually um 
uh, will attack other living organisms. So they will attack other nematodes, they will attack other fungi, they will attack bacteria, and they will attack slugs and things like that. So they actually keep it in check. Now, a lot of slug eggs won't make it through the compost, number one, because of the temperature it got to in first place. But then when the nematodes start growing, they are feeding on these slug eggs anyway. So what you find is that although there are slugs in your compost um, when it's finished, you um, they will migrate back out of the compost when it's finished. So if you've still got them in the compost, it's not finished yet. Um, they will move into the next bin that hasn't finished composting. So, you know, I've dug out, like I said, nearly five ton of compost and there's not a slug in any of it because they've all just migrated out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's it's so so there's a couple different and we've talked about some of this. Those slugs and those those slug eggs are not going to be in the middle of the pile. If you have a hot pile, it's just too hot for any of They're those all on the animals. And so it'll be on the outer surfaces. They do continue to help break down that material into smaller particles that can then be broken down by the bacteria. But if you see a, a, a huge amount of vermin or animals or anything else, that could be a sign that your pile may be ready to use. It's cooled down to the point that yeah. you don't have all that heat buildup, which is why everything's coming back building into the pile. The pile um, building the pile right will stop the vermin like rats and mice and things, okay? Um, and I did a video on that a while ago. Uh, you know, um, I've never had a rat in these compost bays. And, you know, I've been using them for three and a half, but I've been using them. I've been using compost there for nearly eight years, but three and a half years, those bays. And people thought that there'd be rats you know living in them and everything but because i build the compost right it um it doesn't uh you know it doesn't they don't go in there at all and that's what it's about it's about getting things right so that you stop the things like rats and vermin coming uh your possums or whatever the case being uh that you have um but also that things like slugs and what have you that they migrate out when the compost is finished because there's nothing left for them to, to feed on um as as the, as it turns to compost well the microbial life is still breaking that down but all the goodness and the sugars and stuff that slugs require is all gone at that point the bacteria they, ate it all yeah so they just move out and they go looking for food elsewhere if um people are worried about uh slugs you know Get sort of mentioned down on their lettuce and greens and things well go and make yourself some slug nematodes and um water that onto your garden where you don't want them and they will manage the slug population for you there and then you can let them be in your compost it doesn't matter and, and so brian's wondering and and this is something i don't do uh, though i will put some of my native soil in when i'm starting a brand new bed i'll put in a layer of soil uh, other than that, I don't do anything to inoculate my soil. But how about, uh, he's, he's specifically asking about a wooded area, um, but do you see any need at all to inoculate, no. Paul? Because you so, can buy compost inoculators yeah. that I think are a waste of time. What I'll say with this, Brian, is that compost is bacteria-dominated, whereas um, leaf mold is fungal-dominated, okay? Now, um, I have used... Uh, a small sample of soil from the local forest for my leaf mold to bring in the molds in like just an right. inoculation, okay, for leaf mold because that's <laughs> fungal dominated. Bringing fungi into a bacterial environment, although there is fungi in there, it's really not required. It's going to appear anyway in the wood chips and uh, the bark and everything else that you're putting in there. So you don't need to worry about it for just normal compost. Maybe just a small handful into a, like a leaf bin if you're going to do leaf mold. And I'm not talking lots and literally a handful. Yeah, you know, that's all I do is, is literally yeah. just a handful just yeah. to... For leaf mold, it's great. Never, ever worry about it for, for normal compost. There's no, there's no need for it. Yeah, I, I completely agree, especially if it's in contact with the ground already. All of your native bacteria, soil-borne organisms 
they're going to populate that pile just because the bottom is in contact and they're going to absolutely explode. and again you know you're going to get metal rhizal fungi strands running through the ground anyway underneath that they're going to come up into this because it's there's a lot of carbon in there well that's perfect for them you know they're going to latch onto that and um you know so you will get a fungal thing in it but just think when you, every time you turn that anyway that's going to destroy some of that fungi okay but the bacteria uh, just will remultiply the fungi will we go but that's part of the reason why i only turn my compost once just mm -hmm. to allow the fungi and the bacteria just to enjoy life do what they want to do as long as they produce me lovely dark brown compost at the end of it uh, i'm a happy guy like you know they yeah. can do what they need to do and they've had a happy life to get it yeah. to that point and the good thing is you're then spreading that on your garden and they're going down then looking for things then to you know to attach to the root systems um this is why i always say you should have like green manures in the garden because i was ill last year i didn't do it and i've noticed that my ground has been battered by the storms we've had and it's starting to cake where because i have a quite a lot of clay soils um but um normally it wouldn't be like that because i've grown a green manure you know um but but like i said you know i've got five ton of compost i've still got three bays to empty um that's fantastic but, but um that'll end up all over the garden you know it'll probably only be a thin layer all of my garden because i've got a very large garden but it'll be uh handy to put out and then i'll have the same thing come out in june and i'll, I'll as I'm harvesting crops in June and July and what have you, I'll put in layers again then. And then by January, I'll have another load then that I can do the same thing again. That's fantastic. Uh, and, and so here's a question I get a lot as well. We say that you can compost anything organic, but are there things that we should avoid composting if we have the option? Right. A lot of people uh, worry about things like um, tomatoes with blight, um, you know, and uh, if potatoes get blight, they worry about it. They worry about putting in things like onions that had white rot. They worry about putting in uh, bindweed and kutch grass and or duck grass, whatever you want to call it. You know, they worry about those sorts of perennial roots, um, you know, but if you're composting right and you get it up to the right temperatures, all of that will break down. Yeah. A lot of the blights and things like that, and even white rot, they need living organic matter in which to continue thriving. By the time the compost is finished, all of that living matter is dead, it's gone, they can't survive. So you've killed all of that. So blight, I, I compost blighted tomatoes if I ever get it. I haven't had blight on my tomatoes for the last 10 years, mind, but I've composted blighted tomatoes from other people around me who just wanted to chuck them off the edge i'm like stick them in there I'll, I'll sort that out but because i know i can get my temperatures up to the right level and i know that i'm going to kill that pathogen off um yeah. as far as bindweed and kutch grass goes i'm happy to chuck in small amounts of them into there as well because i know that the temperature is going to kill that bindweed off as a rule if you're not confident in composting those perennial roots i would put to the side and i would make uh you know i put them in a bucket of water and let them break down in there and use that water to water the garden um yeah, that's until, a good idea. until you know that you can get the temperatures correct um once you know you can hit that thermolytic uh temperature every single time then um you you, you i'm going to worry about what you put in the compost at that point yeah, and I actually, uh, and I've mentioned this in some of my videos as well, I, I compost all of my weeds. Yeah, all now, my weeds. Now, yeah. you know, I try to pull the weed before they've gone to seed so that they're not spreading as I pull them. But, yeah, I completely agree. I, I have no issues at all throwing weeds of all type into the compost pile because it's organic it, matter. Yeah, exactly. But if you think about it, these big roots like uh, dock, dandelion um couch grass duck grass you know bindweed they've they've pushed really far down into the lower depths of the soil that most plants aren't going to reach they've pulled nutrients out of that clay and brought them up to the surface so either 
put them in a bucket and and take those nutrients and water them back on once they've yeah. decayed or put them into your compost. But make sure you can get that compost hot first. If you can't get it hot, don't do it because otherwise they'll just grow throughout your compost. But if you can get it hot, then they will die every single time and you aren't gonna worry about it because everything breaks down once it hits that temperature. And so I've seen a ton of videos. I'm sure you've seen these videos too about burying your kitchen waste. And, and you talked a little bit about the Bokashi where you're taking a material that's already broken down and then putting it in a trench in the garden to incorporate the, the, the bacteria and that material. What are your thoughts on the raw kitchen waste, digging a trench so and just putting it trench in Trench composting. Um, I, I've actually got a section on that in the book as well. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. A lot of people do, especially here in the UK, because you need a moist uh, area for that to happen because the bacteria need that moisture. So if you've got this process isn't really ideal for uh, places that got real dry, sandy soils. Um, you need the moisture for, for it to work. Um, but if you, you know, like I mean, quite a temperate climate here, it's wet you know and and what have you so i dig a trench and you can just put waste in that and it tends to happen for a lot of beans and things like that mm -hmm. so uh fava beans or uh climbing beans things like that you know dig your trench chuck the waste in bury it over job done the pakashi when i was talking about adding the pakashi to that what would happen at this point what you would do with the pakashi use you, you would put that into like a barrel and you would put some of the soil in the barrel, mix that in, and then put that layer across the top of all of those greens, and that would just inoculate it already. But that bacteria is going to come anyway as it starts to decompose. Mm -hmm. So um, it's exactly the same process in, a, in effect. And um, funny enough, I've already filmed that section for uh, for the course. So. Oh. Um, so that section is already filmed for the course, but uh, trench composting is exactly what it says. You can put garden waste, kitchen scraps, anything like that into it. What I will say to you, do not put in things like uh, animal manures that's got bedding in it and things like that, because that's just going to rob all the nitrogen out of your soil. Yeah, so and that, that's the caveat I usually, usually give is that if you do it in one of your active garden beds, you can't or shouldn't put a seed directly on top of that trench with all that raw material because no. if the plants sprout they're not going to be able to grow because all the nitrogen is going to the decomposition underground that's, right. that's why doing trench composting is good at this time of year because i like i said i've already filmed it they've done it probably in the middle of january for a layer where peas are going to be going and I won't plant those peas out till probably May. So right. it's had four or five months at that point to break down. So it'll make really good nutrition for the peas. It'll also act as a bed to hold moisture. But at that point, it's gone through the process of breaking down. And then, you know, you, you can continue uh, to grow in it that way. So it's it, trench composting is something that, you know, you need months for it to, to start working before you can plant there. So if you've you plan on planting all of your beds, then trench composting isn't going to be a process that you want to, to be utilizing. Yeah. And so um, I think this is a good point from Masabi Gao. We, those of us that have space, those of us that have big gardens, we talk about the three bin system. We talk about trying to make as much compost as we can possibly make. But, but I don't think any gardener should think that if they're not making a whole bunch of compost, they're doing something wrong. A lot of people don't have the space. They don't have the physical ability to make compost. So if you could, if, if you're someone like uh, shorter and older, as Masabi Gal says, and, and you still want to compost, what would be the easiest way for a gardener to compost without having to worry about the big bins and all the materials and all of the work behind it? Build a rough pile in the garden. Just pile it as high as you can. And um, all you've got to do is turn it to the next spot over. Um, that's the easiest way. But for someone who's having issues, uh, firstly, a three bay system you don't need. You can just have a single bay if you wanted that and just turn it out and then turn it back in. OK, um, but if you're having issues, you've got no space, you want to compost. 
and uh, you, you, you know, have mobility issues, things like that. You can get compost tumblers. Um, they're okay as long as you've got a good design, okay? There's a lot of compost tumblers out there that are absolutely rubbish. There's no paddles inside to actually turn things around. So when you turn them, it just slides around the bottom. It doesn't actually turn the compost. Um, and that's usually what you find with people who say, oh, they don't work is mm -hmm. because they've got a poorly designed compost tumbler and it doesn't actually agitate the things inside. They just slide yeah. around. You need paddles inside the compost tumbler to actually break everything up and, and turn it. Um, but, uh, you know, look, at the end of the day, there's lots of different ways to compost and you need to find one that's suitable for your scenario, where you are, uh, anybody can compost if it's on the kitchen counter you can use bakashi if it's yeah. in the backyard you can use any of the systems we talked about and at the very least just stick all the ingredients in a pile on the floor cover it over with a tarp and then every now and then just turn it over by its side and then cover it back over you know uh you know there, there are various issues and again we were talking like the dalek style compost bins with the mm -hmm. lid on the top and the door in the bottom you can use something like that you know th there's lots of different options open to people you just need to find the one that's right for you and the process that's right yeah i i, I had a gardener friend years and years ago almost 20 years ago now who had a beautiful landscape just a, a, a amazingly beautiful garden uh, to the point that that it was in, featured in commercials locally and her method of composting was a corner of her yard that she just threw all the waste into and let it build up into a big pile and then she flipped it once and that yeah. was it that's that's how she made it. she she devoted most of her time and attention on the plants and the pruning and the growing of the plants and the compost was just something that took care of itself and, and and that's it like like i said you know we can make composting as hard as we want to by going into all of the science behind it and everything else and understanding the process or you can make it as easy as possible by just dumping everything in a pile don't worry about the temperatures don't worry about yeah. the uh water or anything and just leave nature do its own thing now by understanding the process we can speed that up really <coughs> But it yeah. doesn't mean it won't happen if you just throw it into a pile and just forget about it. Um, it might go smelly and this, that, and the other. But if it's out of the way, it doesn't matter. It can go smelly. It will still break down. Um, but it's understanding the process, which is what the book was all designed um, to do. It, and it was so that people can go and learn the journey from the very beginning, understand what the carbon nitrogen ratio is, understand about moisture levels, understand all the different processes, and then if they want to, get into the calculations at the end. But like I said, I've even taken that away from them and said, look, here's the calculations, this is how, how it's worked out, but go here and there's a calculator, all you've yeah. got to do is put in your weights. Just fill in the blanks and it all figures out. And so I have no doubt with everyone who's been watching now and everyone who will watch this on replay that you obviously know what you're talking about when it comes to composting and and the book. And, and I can affirm this. The book really is fantastic. So let's talk a little bit about the book. Linda's asking, <coughs> when will it be available? I know that it, it hasn't been finalized yet, but what's no, the time so, frame and, and so what's your moment, plan? The, the book is... Um, uh, having its last edit and the uh, internal layout is is being finalized. Um, I had a cover design that didn't like it, so I threw that out that idea out, and uh, a new cover is being designed as well because it just wasn't really congruent with with the content of the book. Mm -hmm. So those few things still need to be addressed. The book is hoping to be released towards the end of April and i'll keep everybody informed anyway um and it will be available via amazon and all good bookshops so um the it doesn't matter wh wherever sells books they should be able to order it because it'll be available from through ingham spark as well so that's where all the bookshops tend to order from directly and they'll then be able to get copies ordered for and does that want. include the states? Will, will, will I'm hoping American that it'll be, bookshop? Yeah, I'm hoping it'll be on um, Amazon, 
uh, .com, .ca, .uk and .au uh, to start with. And um, Ingham Spark uh, deals uh, through the States, Australia and the UK for supplying the Fantastic. likes of big bookstores and things like that. So, And if not, you should be able to order it through your local bookstore. Great. And and I, I really do recommend it. Uh, I, I haven't seen the final. You showed me the cover that you yeah, There's still a lot discarded. of work to go on when you add the original non-edited yeah. version. Things so have I, been taken out and added, but... I haven't seen the final version yet, but uh, this really is a good... It, it's a reference source. Uh, Teeming with Microbes is one of the books I recommend that gardeners have in their library because yeah. it gives a lot of the science uh, behind soil. And, and you also tie in, in fact, you, you spend a good amount of time in the book talking about soil and the importance of soil. It's not all about compost because the reason we're making compost is to add to our soil and get all of its benefits to improve the soil in the garden. So let, let's go ahead and finish up with that. If you just want to spend just I, a little bit I talking about the soil and yeah. that correlation. I don't think it could be a masterclass without including the soil, um, because when you when you look at plants, they need that soil in which to thrive. People will fill the beds full of compost and then wonder why three months later there's got no nutrition in it because the plants have drawn all of the 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 sort of nutritional value out of that compost. But putting layers in of compost on top of garden soil that already has microbial life in there and it has all of the um the mineral content and things like that this is what you need for a good balance for your plants now when we feed the soil okay that builds microbial life within the soil those microbes then uh produce in your soil and what's happening there is the whole process of life is going on. So we have some microbes growing and they're feeding, breaking things down and they are defecating in the soil, which is releasing microbes, uh, sorry, releasing nutrients into the soil. Mm -hmm. And then they are dying, which is decaying in the soil, which releasing more nutrients. And then you have the likes of nematodes eating other um, bacteria and fungi and things like that. And that's also breaking down so we have this complete cycle going on it's called the soil food web for a reason this huge cycle is going on in your soil and compost yeah. is the food that we are giving to feed those microbial life in the soil that is all it's for we're not creating compost to feed our plants and it's by feeding the microbial life in the soil they feed our plants OK, and that's what it's about. And so much so, and I've covered this so much, so uh, so much in the book that um, I asked Dr. Elaine Ingham to write the foreword for this book, which she agreed to. So and um, for the, and for people who don't know, Dr. Elaine Ingham is the one that has developed that concept of the soil food web. So when we talk about this big interaction, it's Dr. Elaine Ingham that is the one that's speaking around the, the world on experts. that topic. Yeah. And um, I'm very lucky that she agreed to write the foreword for the book. I'm still waiting on that foreword at the moment. Um, but as you can appreciate, she's very busy. So there's a couple of things that may hold the book off from being launched by the end of April. But hopefully everything is still on go for, for the end of April. I mean, the book is finished. All the photos are done. The uh, All the graphics and everything are, are done. Um, like I said, it's just all typesetting and stuff like that now that he's doing. And I'm waiting on the foreword to, to come. And But but like I said, you know, I mean, this this life under the under the soil that's going on, people have no idea about it. And they they think that they're producing compost to feed the plants, yeah. but but you're not. And and that's what what the book is about. It's understanding that process. It's understanding why we make compost in the first place, how it's made, and why uh, how the bacteria and the soil and the fungi and everything else all play that part of that food chain. And it's the smallest amounts they move on, and then the worms. Uh, carry on the process and the arthropods and everything else that mm -hmm. goes up to that food web. And um, I've got a big infographic in the book that shows this whole process working. And and then the plants 
feed from all the nutrition that's being created because of that life cycle down there. Fantastic. Yeah, it, it really is good. And, and so Tony and I have talked previously, and I think I mentioned this uh, recently in a live stream as well, that when the book does come out, Tony is actually offering a signed copy to subscribers of the Gardner Scott channel. So uh, sometime I'm guessing it'll probably be May or June by the time everything gets finalized. But but yeah. you can look for that. You, the viewer, can look for that in the future that you'll have the opportunity to, to get a signed copy. Um, but w when it comes out, I would say don't wait for that single signed copy. I'll definitely tell everybody about it and it, it get out there and get it. So, you know, even if you've got a copy, it would make a really good gift for somebody that, you know, and, uh, you know, another gardener in your life, you know, um, and uh, like I said, so if you've bought a copy and it's not signed and you want to keep the same copy, then that's, that's, that's right. you, you know, um, but you can pass on your copy. And, and, and I've written the book in a way that I hope people use it like a reference, like you said, Scott, you know, that they come back and, and look at these sections and think, all oh, right, that's why that's doing that. Oh, right. I now understand that. And eventually over time, people will understand the process so much more that, um, they won't need the book then because they'll be able to write the book of their own. You know, it's, and, and yeah, that's, that's what, what I, I want people to understand is that this whole process is just, uh, you know, just a process, follow it along and learn from those sort of steps as you go and, and understand it because it's not until we understand something to, uh, we can't assimilate it if we don't understand it. And once you understand, you get composting and you know exactly how to compost and you can do it with your eyes shut. And uh, it's just that understanding that, that, that people are lacking at the moment, I think, that are struggling with compost. Yeah, and, and you do have a really good step-by-step -step process in your book. As I was reading it, you know, and you know, I've been composting for a long time, and I, I would read a section and think, oh, wow, that was so well explained. I wonder if he's going to talk about, and then two pages later, you're talking about the thing that I was linking to. And then I think, oh, wow, he really linked these. Well, I wonder if he's going to talk about, and then you covered, you covered literally everything that I could think of about composting. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't think you were going to cover vermicomposting, worm composting, you cover that. I was thinking, I wonder if he's going to talk about Bokashi, and you talk about Bokashi. So it, it really is, that's why it's such a great reference book, because regardless of what type of composting someone chooses to do, um, you've talked about it, and you've talked about it in a very easy to understand way. So I hope everybody ends up with a copy of your book. I, I've already referred to it myself as I've started thinking about some future think, videos I'm making. I, you know, uh, the, the, the problem I had with the book was keeping it to a length that people would read, you know, and, and, and putting the information across because I could talk for months about composting and getting that across in 80,000 words is hard work, <laughs> you know, it's knowing when to stop is the, uh, but you know, you know, manage to get everything right at a, at a good size and but cover everything in depth. And that was what I wanted. I didn't see the point in writing a book that someone was going to be coming from me, scratching it, going, well, I still don't really understand. Yeah. I wanted it to be no qualms. You go in there, you read that book from front to finish, you know, from front cover to back cover, and you, you can go from it thinking, right, okay, this is the one I want to do. That's how I've got to do it. I'm going to go and try it. And then the practical side of things that's why i'm making the course as well um the practical side of things then will be a little bit different but putting the theory into practice so you can see it working and uh, and things like that because you know it's all well and good having a book and telling people how to do something if they don't think that you can do it yourself then yeah. you know um they, there's no buy into it but the course will actually show that process. And uh, like I said, I've already filmed the trench part. I've uh, filmed the harvesting part now because I've just done it because I already uh, completed my compost last year for this year, you know, um, and we'll be building new piles. So we'll be filming that as well. And, yes. and that'll all go in the course, um, which 
it won't mirror the information that's in the book but what it will do is give you an explanation based around those factors fantastic well yankee sister i want to give a shout out to you thank you so much for that super thank you very chat. much and i agree with her this has been an amazing live and even for for people who have been composting for years there's still a lot to learn and uh, i want to thank you for your time here today no and for all those who may have come in late or missed it at the beginning, Tony O'Neill has the Simplify Gardening channel, and it is fantastic. Uh, and, and so tying in with your channel, we've been talking about the book, we've been talking about composting, and, and the literal tons of compost that you have. I'd like to have that problem. Uh, are you not planning? <laughs> I know. I, I know. I, I wish it was a problem that I had too much. Yeah. I'll never get to that point. No. Uh, are you uh, not necessarily moving in a, in a different direction because you're known for your potatoes? You're known for a lot of the other subjects you do. Will you be doing more compost videos? Do you think now that you've got this book, like Charles Dowding now? basically every time he does a video he has to talk about the no dig method because he did the no dig book and so do you find yourself thinking that way where you're going no. to be doing more compost videos or the same old stuff you've been doing i'm going to continue doing i don't get me wrong there will be compost videos I, I mean i've made a lot of them already and i will continue to make them um but i'll give you an exclusive I've just finished writing the second book, which is called uh, Your First Vegetable Garden. So that will hopefully be out in December. And um, that uh, is just going back to basics, you know, setting up the structure of the garden, um, you know, and basically taking over a garden for your very first day to harvesting. And that's what that book is about. So although I've produced a book on composting, I mean, my channel's all about gardening all over yeah. my website's all about everything to do around growing. And I, I like that. I, I don't want to be known for just potatoes or just compost or, or whatever the case being. I'd rather people see the channel as a resource like yours is, um, where they can come and get any sort of gardening information. And, um, and if I haven't got a video on it already, I will be making videos on it. But I've got videos on most things. Thank yeah. you, Susan. I appreciate that. Yeah. The, the, uh, and, and, and as Susan said, she subscribed. So definitely check out Tony's channel and subscribe. And yeah, I, I, I'll be doing a presentation uh, for... We have a horticultural art society here in Colorado Springs. And on March 4th, I'm actually doing a Zoom presentation for them uh, at, as a class. And yesterday I was talking to the the facilitator for that class I'll be doing about my channel. And she was asking about different subjects. And it's like, oh yeah, I have a video on that. And then she'd ask something else. I'd say, oh yeah, I've got a video on that. And, and so the reason I bring that up is because you have more videos than I have on my channel. And I've got videos on just about everything. But yeah. Every subject I can think of, you've already got a video on that subject as well. Yeah, you know, I, I've I've been on YouTube for coming up to twelve years, and well, I've been on longer than that. But making these videos uh, for coming, two thousand and eleven was the first video I made uh, for gardening. And when you know, when you're making sort of content like this, you're going to cover everything and. Uh, even more so now because over the last sort of four or five years, I've really sort of been making specific videos rather than just here's what I'm doing videos. Right. And um, and the last four, sort of five years or so, I've been making videos dedicated to helping people with a specific problem. And um, so because of that, um, yeah, I've got, I mean, videos on everything from... Uh, you know, from avocados right the way through to, you know, growing bloody trumpet uh, gourds. The trumpet vine? Like mm. You know, and, you know, pond building, um, uh, you know, water catchment. And in the middle of that, now I filmed it today, but I did have an old version of that from a different, when I was on a different site, but I've just filmed a new version of that video today. 
Um, you know, so I've got videos on pretty much everything. Um, but as we go on, we not only improve our knowledge, but also improve our skills at presenting and teaching and yeah. videoing and things like that. So we may want to make some of the older videos and not even that. Sometimes you'll make a really good video that should do really well that goes absolutely nowhere and no one ever sees it. So sometimes you need to remake that video for it to get yeah. you know seen again, you know? So, you know, I, I'll still be right across the board. I'm not going to just be making compost videos. I mean, I've got probably 40 videos on potatoes. You know, I've probably got 10 videos on compost, but I've also got like five videos on bananas. I got five videos <laughs> on grapes. Do you know? So I've got lots of different videos, you know? Yeah. Well, it's great having you here, buddy. Thank uh, you. In the States, we say buddy. In the UK, you say mate. And oh, pal. so, uh, pal. Uh, so we will we will definitely talk again, and it's always great to to have you on the live stream. As you've seen from the comments, lots of people have appreciated it today, and and I'll probably ask you to be on again when the book comes out, and yeah, well, so we everyone will that. get an opportunity to to see you again. Yeah, as well. and they can see the book, and we can maybe go through some of the book so that people can see what's in it, and uh, and then you can decide then how you're going to do that giveaway and. Uh, you know how people are gonna however you want to do it you know and then i'll get a book sent you i'll sign it and then send it out so there'll be a bit of delay obviously because it's got to go to the states from the uk um but at least then they'll have a signed yeah. copy you know? and it could be so this is open to all of, of the gardner scott subscribers so it's very possible when we figure out uh the randomness and and pull the book it could be someone in the uk that actually yeah, it could be, yeah. Yeah, gets, but gets obviously, as well. I just want people to be aware that it might be a little bit of time if they, you know, sure. if they win it and it's another country, I've got to send it out there and things like that, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and let you go. And right. uh, it's it's evening time in the UK, just as some of us are starting our morning. So, um, Tony, mate, good to see you here. And thanks for sharing all yes, of your Scott. wonderful information with everybody. Thanks all. I'll see you all soon. Okay. Bye. Take care. And so, great show today. I'm so glad that Tony was here. I'm so glad you all asked those wonderful questions. And I'll remind you, I saw that uh, Jay had mentioned it here in just a little bit in the comments ago, that I will not be live next week. On February 28th, I will not have a live show. I looked into it where I'm going to be, the, uh, and I don't think I'm going to have the internet at the time that I'll be uh, at the location in a week from now. So, don't don't come looking for a show on Monday. I won't be here, but on Wednesday, I will be visiting Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds. They're going to give me an amazing tour. I'll be talking to the, the founder of Baker Creek, and so I'll be getting their stories, doing lots of filming. You can expect to see videos on that. And on Friday, I'll be visiting the Green Stock Factory, and they're doing the same thing. I'll be talking to the inventor and the owners of the company. So you should be able to see some good behind the scenes uh, information and footage in future videos. But I'm going to be leaving later today and doing that road trip and I'll miss the live stream next week. So it's always great to spend time here with you all on Monday, but it'll be two Mondays from now before I get to spend that time with you again. Hope you have a great gardening week. I look forward to sharing my my trip with you when I get back in two weeks, and I hope you're all here to hear about that adventure. Thanks for being here today. I'm Gardner Scott. Enjoy gardening.